Jack Middleton Robert Williams voluntarily returned from self-exile today and immediately was arrested as a fugitive. The reality is that America is not God, America is not the end of the earth, and it doesn't matter what the Americans think, in the final analysis, the truth will come out. Well, I advocated violent self-defense because I don't think you can really have a defense against violent racists and against terrorists unless you're prepared to meet violence with violence. Small town, typical of southern towns. Me, my wife, run all over town. Everywhere we go, the people would turn us down, Lord, and then we go down. My father was a railway worker, but they had a system on the railroad. But the boilermaker had to be a white man, and so they could, uh, they would all, the white man could have a helper. And my father used to do all of this work. The white man was getting the money, and the white man stayed drunk about all the time. In later years, the whites in the community used to always tell me that I should be like my father, that he was a good man, and that he was a hard worker, and he never gave any trouble. I lived out in the rural area of Union County, and when they talked about Rob Williams, we were really young children, and we had mixed feelings about who this man was. Of course, I had some fear, a fear for him and for what it might do for the community, because I lived in a predominantly white community out in the country, and uh, the men and women talked very openly about how they felt what they thought this strange person was doing to upset the normalcy of our community. He's Mr. Boss Man. Tell me what I've done. How come you lock me away from the light? The clan tried to make a black woman dance on the street coming at gunpoint. Otherwise they make somewhat of a jig. It's like a puppet, you know, when you're dangling the puppet on the string. You completely reduce then to nothing. And that's one thing that helped set that first thing off in Monroe in fifty seven. That's what set off to God. Then we started to really getting organized and setting up and uh, digging foxholes, and we started getting ammunition. Rob had these guns, high-powered rifles, you know, all we had was 22s and 410 shotguns hunting, you know, and got a chance to, you know, to use the uh, high-powered weapons and become proficient with them. And he taught us a little, uh, what do you call it, karate or self-defense things, you know, we drilled with him and trained with him. Much of our guard was young. We had guys that were 16 years old, 15 and 16, some, uh, we had some too in the 40s and 50s, but a good many of them were the very young high school students and dropouts. We were never looking for trouble, you know, as long as we, you're peaceful, we're peaceful, but if you come violent, we have to become violent, you know. We weren't attacking anybody or fighting against anybody, just protecting ourselves, you know had 200 armed, plus we had others who would have been on call, about five or 600 guns, because some people had guns who weren't directly participating, but they were on call if we needed them. I guess he weighed, 
like maybe about maybe 220 for the time, but I was pretty big. And uh, he was style strong now. Rob could have handled himself now, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> you know, he, he could have handled himself. Rob, he carried his gun right on his side, go right downtown, go everywhere Rob went, he carried his 45 right on. Now, where he'd use it now, I don't know. But I guess people felt the same way like I felt. They, they didn't know. So they didn't bother Rob. <laughs> Threatened with death, he walked down the street wearing a pistol on his belt, which would be a normal white Southern thing to do. <laughs> white Southerners, their rights challenged will react with, with uh, vehemence and force. Uh, but for a black man to act as an equal in that way was just unthinkable. He found humor in uh, dealing with the Klan on the telephone. People would call with threatening calls. I remember one time he, <laughs> he heard one of the Klansmen uh, call his own wife's name, Stella, or something like that. Stella, be quiet. I'm trying to talk to this nigga, or something like that, you know. And so the next time he called, Rob said, how sweet Stella doing? <laughs> and the man said, what do you know about Stella? I'd soon kill Stella as to kill you. When the motorcade would come through a black community, Everybody would pull their blind, lock up in the houses, and they were afraid. But instead, we came out, and our people would come out and line standing along the street with their guns, you see. You know, I think about this courageous guy who dared to deviate from the accepted norm, who dared to say, you know, we're not taking this. You, you're not just going to beat us up. You're not going to fire in our homes without us defending ourselves. And that really is the American norm. <laughs> I wouldn't go nowhere without one. So <laughs> yeah, we had to have guns because they had them. And that's the only way we repelled them is because we outgunned them. We had lots and lots of guns around the house all the time. Um, rifles especially after we organized our rifle club uh people would send us 26 dollars uh donation to buy a rifle for the protection of our community One evening in October of 1958, there were some two black boys and some white girls and boys playing in a vacant lot in Monroe. And on toward evening, a kissing game ensued. Someone kissed someone. Well, nobody had seen it, but the girl just had made a casual remark to her mother that she had kissed Hanover. And then the mother got all excited and started scrubbing her scrubbing the face and called the father and he threatened to kill him, go kill him, and got his shotgun. The police went looking for them too. They found the two little boys, arrested them, uh, uh, t beat them, uh, locked them in the basement of the jail for six days without being able to see their parents or talk to an attorney. Um, terrified them. They, it, it, it so happened that Halloween uh, it, the, it was October 28th, and then on Halloween, the police officers put on sheets and came down into the basement of the jail where the children were being held, thinking it would be real funny to terrify them because the children knew that the Klan was outside calling for their blood. And they had to teach these boys early that they just couldn't, couldn't expect to, to cross the color line in sex. 
There were two separate hearings, one for the white families and one for the black boys. And then the, the local judge sentenced the boys to reform school uh, to a, for a period not to exceed their 21st birthday. Now they were eight and 10 years old. He turned into kind of a one-man press office for the, for the kissing case, and he managed to get this out onto the front pages of newspapers all over the world. The bad publicity uh, really forced Hodges to intervene and release the boys after only four months. Uh, Hodges made a big show of how they had now been rehabilitated. One of the important things about the kissing case is that it brings Rob to a kind of national and even international recognition. Then there was the case of Mrs. Reed, Mary Ruth Reed. She was about, I think, seven or eight months pregnant. And this man, white man, came to her house and he was, first he tried to get her to go to bed with him and she resisted and he beat her, started attacking her. The struggle went into the field between two houses and her white neighbor saw uh, Medlin beating her and pulling at her clothing and ran out. Um, and uh, and her, she and her children were fighting with him and the white woman came out and she saw what had happened and uh, uh, he, he eventually left uh, without having raped her, but he had tried. So what had happened was that during this time, some men in the community, this woman also had some brothers, had three or four brothers. And the men in our guard said that we should kill this man. Rob said, no, no, no. Let's let the law handle it. So, and he really, be, Rob really believed in the law during those days. They brought this man, Louis Medlin, Medlin the white man, Brought his wife and sat him at his side all during the time of travel on it. His lawyer got up and said, Judge, Your Honor, this man is not guilty. But he was just drinking, having a little fun. Said, so, you see this woman sitting here at his side? This is the pure flower of life, God's greatest gift to man, this white woman. And do you think that he would leave this pure flower of life for that? And so, that was the end of the trial. They found him not guilty and dismissed the case. At that point, every black woman in the courtroom was in tears and angry and ready to do something. And they took uh, the accuser out the back door. They took them out the back door and when we all met down where Rob was, uh, and he saw what our condition was and how, and one woman said, you, these people have uh, declared open season on black women. What, can, what are you gonna say now? What are we gonna do now? And that's when he made that statement. I made a statement that if the law if the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution cannot be enforced in this social jungle called Dixie, it is time that Negroes must defend themselves even if it is necessary to resort to violence. That there is no law here, and there is no need to, to take the white attackers to the courts because they will be free, and that the federal government is not coming to the aid of people who are oppressed, and it is time for Negro men to stand up and be men, and that if it's necessary for us to die, we must be willing to die. If it's necessary for us to kill, we must be willing to kill. Lord, I'm in trouble, trouble, makes me weep and moan. 
Dawn and trouble, trouble. Since the day I was born, Lord, I'm trouble, trouble. Sure won't make me stay. Lord, I'm trouble. I think it's fair to say that both the NAACP, SCLC, the orthodox civil rights movement of the time depended so heavily on white northern liberal support that they're fearful that embracing Williams or supporting Williams means immediately losing that support. I wasn't going to crawl to try to appease and accommodate white people who were giving money, contributing money, that it was a matter of human dignity. So they said I was suspended for six months. The chapter said, well, if he's suspended for six months, then we will appoint his wife as the president of the branch and that he will run the branch through his wife. So we went uptown with Rob and went to an Oasis and went in there and sat down. And people started moving things off the counter, looking just like we were something out of space. They had a little hole there, I call it a hole in the wall, where black people went to get served and walk out on the street, you know. Coming down the street in town, we'd be coming down in line in the file, and they would start locking the doors of these different lunch counters, closing down all together. They just to have business closed until we left. Strong group people started forming on the streets and they said I should be killed. Nineteen sixty one was the fourth summer in a row that Robert Williams and the NAACP and Monroe had tried to integrate the swimming pools. So they kept showing up the pool with their shorts and their towels, and they did it over and over again. And, uh, you know, one time they went out there and they're, they're standing around with their, their signs, uh, you know, protesting the fact that, they're, that the, they can't, that this pool is supported by tax funds and they're not permitted to use it. And people shot at them. The shots that I remember came from across the other side of the creek, which was down the hill from the, 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 the swimming pool. And there was this creek, and they were on the other side of the creek firing as you hear the bullet whizzing over our heads, you know. Chief of Police was standing there. I asked him, did he hear these bullets? He said, no, he didn't hear anything. I told him, well, that was good. But I was glad to know that he didn't hear very well, because when we started shooting, he wouldn't hear it either. We were coming up 601, and we reached the top of the hill. At the, I think it was a hilltop cafe or something. Um, this car comes out into the road and hits us, you know. And I think they were waiting for us because there was a lot of people there. The police were there, supposedly directing traffic and ignoring the fact that the mob was closing in on Rob's car with the teenagers, and Rob uh, saw that the police was not going to intervene to help them, and so he asked, he stepped out of the car and asked one of the teenagers in the back to pass him his rifle. When they saw that we were armed, the crowd kind of, you know, held up. And then that's when the police got involved, because they were there all the time and saw what was going on, but they never moved until they saw we had weapons. And they wanted to come and take our weapons away, and Robert said, no, I, I ain't gonna give up my gun unless they give up theirs. And I put the rifle in the face, so we're not gonna surrender to any mob. Then there was an old man out there who started crying. The man was just crying like a child, like a baby. He said, what is this country coming to? He said, the goddamn niggas got guns, and the police can't even arrest them. And <laughs> so... <laughs> That's where he got the title, Negroes with Guns. Phone calls that would come uh, throughout the night, oftentimes, where they were, people would call and they would make threats. But they were pretty consistent 
as we increase our civil rights activities. And uh, then things got to the point where uh, threats were being made, that people were threatening to bomb the house. There were times when people would come by the house and shoot guns. You have to understand that in the, in the years between, say, 1957 and 1961 in Monroe, there were Klan rallies with as many as 15,000 people in attendance. And it was dangerous. They were constantly under attack. And uh, the, the Klan was large and violent, and it killed other people. By 1961, the aggressive approach to local rights problems had brought violence to Monroe. And Williams and his followers had strayed farther away from the main line of Negro thinking. These incidents awakened the concern of moderate whites and Negroes alike. The Ku Klux Klan and other segregationist groups began taking a greater interest in the Monroe situation, too. In line with his policy of armed self-defense, Williams organized Negro gun clubs. The town of Monroe was becoming a potential powder keg, an incident waiting to happen. A railroad slices through Monroe, it's not one town but two towns. On the right, Monroe is white, and on the left is Newtown. Eighteen Freedom Riders came in August 61, at the call of young Rob Williams to see what could be done. We could use the help, so uh, that's when James Foreman and Paul Brooks came into the, uh, to the community to help us to protest, and I think it was uh, Foreman who said that uh, the King forces wanted to prove nonviolence uh, as uh, was, was successful over violence. The only thing I knew, you know, they, I, they said the Freedom Riders coming. They said, Rob, we're getting the Freedom Riders to come. And then, you know, the next thing I knew, you know, the guy was coming in from New York and places, Washington, D.C. and places, and a lot of those guys, they were going to Harvard and Yale doing research on hunger strike. Well, <clears throat> there was also an English girl who had come, English uh, a student, who had written me a letter and said she was visiting the United States and she had never been to the South. And she heard that we had demonstrations going, and she would like to visit us there. And if if I would allow her to come, she would come there and help us work, which and whatever she could do. He was the first person I had ever met who could talk about great values and, and splendid ideas, and about justice and liberty, and sound genuine and sound convincing and not just be somebody, you know, putting on an act. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. They didn't really know what they were facing in Monroe. They'd never been through a southern town before. And some of their manners were atrocious. Now, I remember they would tell us, like, say, if you can't take it, don't go up there. Because he said, this, go, this is a non violent. Like uh, people who are spitting on you, kicking you, and pushing you, and all this kind of stuff, you know. You know, because they said, like, if you go up there, this is probably what's going to happen. If you can't take it, don't go. One of the Freedom Riders who walked in front of me, and uh, this little white girl walks up to him and said, uh, are you a nigger lover? He said, yes, I am. And she spit in his face. Of course, the real hot button is white women, white women and black men. The pavements opposite, on the other side of the road, were clearly packed with people. Um, there were certainly people shouting every kind of abuse. 
Um, they were standing there watching um, and clearly weren't going away. They didn't just happen to be passing. Um, we'll get you nigger and nigger lovers was the, the, the favorite thing. They picketed for a week. Well, <clears throat> the time was coming up for the weekend. And I wasn't participating in the demonstrations at all because I wasn't going to take any pledge for nonviolence. And <clears throat> so I asked them if they were going to rest on uh, Saturday and Sunday. And they said, no. Some of the northern protesters uh, came to our church which was Central Methodist, which is right uptown, and uh, demanded to be seated, of course. We seated them. And I think that they didn't like being seated as far near the front as they were, but nobody tried to hinder them. We weren't warmly welcomed, but we weren't hostilely received. Uh, I think they behaved quite correctly. We were seated, we were given these little forms. If you're interested in the church in future, please fill in. Um, uh, we came back and I think we had something to eat and then we went into town to pick it. Thousands of Klansmen, Minutemen and other fascist and racist poured into the city and they had said that they were going to crush this demonstration and that they were going to destroy our branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And most of all, they were going to kill me. Then I told the God that it looked like we were going to have a battle that night. You have to understand, these people are separate from Robert Williams in some ways. He's supporting them, he's helping them with some housing, uh, he's willing to help them, but they're really not his people. The situation downtown is so dangerous that uh, that people who were working with Robert Williams went downtown to, to rescue them. Crowds were starting attacking us who were around the courthouse, and the attacks were very, very vicious. We were trying to protect everybody we possibly could, you know, and especially there was young one, one young white uh, lady from um, England, Constant Beaver. James Foreman, you know, tried to get me into one of the one of the cars that had come to take us off. Uh, it wasn't specifically me. There was a move to, to take everybody off. We were told, you know, as soon as the cars come, you all go, uh, and a group of people had already had already gone. Um, so he, he tried to, well, he did put me into the car. And that uh, uh, is one of the things that really set the mob off. And the, the police, the other thing that set the mob off is that the police appeared to be on the side of the mob. There was a shotgun in the car. That's not illegal. It's in plain view. And uh, the police took the shotgun and gave it to a member of the mob. He pointed it at James Foreman. He said, uh, don't you dare touch that car, nigger. James Foreman then did what I, I thought at the time was one of the most courageous acts I've seen. The moment the man said to him, don't you dare touch that car, move back, he immediately put his hand on the car. Um, and the man did not respond because, I mean, when people respond with that much courage, it, it does put people off. And so we made a decision um, to put Constant in the car, and, and, and I think I got in the car. Um, and that's when, as I got in the car, the, the barrel came down on my head. He had blood all pouring down, down his shirt, and the police drove us and the black people they'd been trying to arrest from inside the car and drove. We all packed in and drove to the police station. I started going to the telephone. I told him no, I was too busy. I didn't have to, I wasn't going to accept any more calls. And then they hollered out again and said, well, this is Martin Luther King calling from Atlanta. He wants to talk to you. And I told him to tell him, I, don't, I didn't care who it was, that it was too late now. He didn't come before, and now we're already in battle. On Sunday, that tension exploded 
in front of the Monroe Courthouse as white bystanders clashed with Negro demonstrators. Alarm spread quickly, and soon many Negroes were enraged by reports of beatings and the jailings of some demonstrators. That was a fearful day because people were getting beat up and imprisoned and we didn't know where people were and there was shots fired and everything, you know. But the, 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 the scary part was when the uh, seagulls came onto to the neighborhood and the crowd wanted to, you know, attack them and kill them and Rob said, no, protect them, you know, you, you know, don't let nothing happen to them. And that was the time I felt, you know, I was going to have to fire on some of my own people because they were really angry. According to Mrs. Stegall, she and her husband drove to Monroe Sunday afternoon to visit her mother. They heard of the disturbances in town but weren't involved until they took a shortcut to their destination. Then on Winchester Street, passing through a Negro neighborhood, a crowd suddenly blocked their path. Mrs. Stegall tells what happened then in these words. Everybody had a gun of some kind. It was some of the officers looking guns I've ever seen. And I remember one fellow that come pushing through like that with a, he had a sawed off gun, a double barrel thing. He said, let me kill him, let me kill him, just like that. Now, when did Williams come on the scene? Well, after they had took us out of our car at gunpoint and marched us up the street to his house, and that was the first time I saw him in his yard. They were very, very angry, and I could see that they were very angry. So when I came down, into the yard, uh, Mrs. Stegall said to me, oh, we've been kidnapped. And uh, so I said, well, lady, you're not kidnapped here. If you want to go, you're free to go whenever you are ready. I said, but you've got to go through this crowd. And she said, well, if you take us out of here, we'll be all right. I said, no, I'm not going to take you out because I didn't bring you here and I'm not going to take you away. That you're free to leave whenever you're ready to go. I, I, it hadn't even dawned on me that I was kidnapped. I didn't know I was God. The people were screaming, still screaming. Some were practically hysterical. And one man started crying, just crying like a baby. And he said, give me a gun, give me a gun, let me kill them. And so I could tell that uh, the crowd was becoming too tense. And I got into the crowd around the Stegalls and I started pushing the crowd away from them. According to Mrs. Stegall, she and her husband were to remain in the nearby house, which had been used to quarter Freedom Riders, until 9 o'clock, when they were released and drove through police lines to safety. After the Stegalls were taken from his house, William says he received a threatening phone call which prompted him to leave. He described it this way. Well, they said uh, to me that, Robert, you've caused a lot of trouble in this town, and now state troopers are on the way and in 30 minutes you'd be hanging in the courthouse square. So I told my wife that uh, we were going to have to leave. We l just walked out the back door and that was one of the most frightful things that I've ever done in my life. I had on the worst dress you could ever imagine <laughs> because I had just washed my clothes the day before, or no, that day, and we had them hanging on the line. I left my clothes hanging on the line. Rob had a machine gun and I had his Luger and the two boys were right there with us and uh, we stood there until the police car uh, went down Fairley Avenue and then we crossed Fairley Avenue and continued down the back alley. We were standing up there. I heard a white man say I don't want no niggas up there. Lord, he's a bush man. As soon as we got in New York, I flashed my picture on television, said that I was extremely dangerous. So this complicated the matter because we didn't expect that. You see, because when we left, there was no, no kind of a warrant or anything. Home of the free, land of the free. I don't want to be mistreated by no bourgeoisie law in a bourgeois town. I was given a political asylum in Cuba, and I was there as an exile in Cuba, and I lived there as an exile. Now, were, were there any particular Cuban leaders uh, who gave you this asylum, or was it just the 
you know, in general, the government there? Well, actually, this political exile was given to me uh, under the direct orders of Fidel Castro himself. From Havana, Cuba, free territory of the Americas, Radio Free Dixie invites you to listen to the free voice of the South. Stay with us for music, news, and commentary by Robert F. Williams. He came up with the idea of Radio Free Dixie, and uh, we had to fight. He had to fight hard within Cuba to get, get it on the air. But eventually, Fidel Castro, when he told Fidel Castro what his idea was, he said, well, uh, we'll see what we can do. So finally, they allowed him to have the Radio Free Dixie program. Radio Free Dixie is presenting the soul side of rock in the year of fire. The social conscious rock and roller is calling attention to social injustice. Yes, these new cats are no slackers. We are tuned in to their wavelength, and we dig them plenty. You can hear it throughout the South. You can hear it in New York City. You can hear it in Seattle. You can hear it in Los Angeles. And, you know, they're trying desperately to jam it, and eventually, between the, the Cuban censorship and the FBI <laughs> and the CIA jamming it, um, it reaches a much smaller audience eventually. But we would just almost embrace the radio just to hear his voice. You know, that was, that was the treat of, of the weekend. Radio Free Dixie is proud to present the seldom heard songs of brutal oppression and dehumanization that no American radio station dares broadcast. The music was fantastic, the jazz was fantastic, and uh, sometimes now I can hear those uh, songs echoing in my mind, Watermelon Man and the protest, Nina Simone, Mississippi Goddamn. Alabama's got me so upset, Tennessee made me lose my rest, and everybody knows about Mississippi Goddamn. Robert F. Williams. Afro-American refugee from racial oppression in the USA, former official of the NAACP, author of the book Negroes with Guns. Presently, we must use whatever method in our possession. We must make use of the gas bomb, the lie can, the ice pick, the switchblade, the axe, the hatchet, the razor, the brick, and the bullet. Next year, we shall meet machine gun with machine gun, hand grenade with hand grenade, in a new spirit of meeting violence with violence. Now, did you ever feel that what you were doing was in any way an uh, act of treason or unpatriotism towards your country, towards the United States of America, or had you abandoned America? Did you feel you were now a Cuban or what? Now, I don't believe any man who lives in, under tyranny in a government can ever be truthfully accused of treason. Treason can only come when a man is entitled to the rights and privileges and he is protected by his government and then he betrays that government. Then he can be accused of treason. But when the government uh, betrays its trust to its people, then the government is, is, the, is what is guilty, is the guilty party to treason. And I consider the government of the United States to have failed the black people in America in uh, protecting the rights of black people and the enforcement of the Constitution. The lawlessness that broke out with unbridled fury in the Watts section of Los Angeles was deplored by responsible Negroes and whites alike. In the spirit of 76, in the spirit of Los Angeles, let our people take to the streets in fierce numbers. And in the cause of freedom and justice, let our battle cry be heard around the world. Freedom, freedom, freedom now, ah, uh, death. I think all of us kind of, during that period, felt a certain amount of the romance of revolution. And we, we felt that, uh, that it might work, you know, it might, overcome the odds, you know, where everyone was telling you can't use these tactics because you're only one-tenth of the population.
And well, you know, you look around the world during that time, and you saw in in Castro's Cuba that a small group of revolutionaries had overcome a government. So it seemed, well, maybe it's possible. Negroes with Guns came out in 1962, and it's really uh, probably the most important intellectual influence on the Black Panther Party. It's uh, kind of a founding document of the Black Power Movement in many ways. I think that that influence is something that comes through the 1960s as a, as a theme, ending up with the Black Panther Party, which is the Black Panther Party for self-defense. And, um, and again, I think that that's something that has very strong roots in American traditions. But I tell you, that book, just the very title, I thought was so great, uh, Negroes with Guns. No, you know, we've always had white power, and no one's quivered in the face of that. But all of a sudden, black power comes. This small minority, 10% of the population, says we want black power. And the country goes into paroxysms of fear and condemnation and scorn. They were becoming more radical. They were becoming less patient with the nonviolent and patient philosophy that was coming out of the civil rights movement. And they saw him, because you have to remember, they saw Robert Williams as a heroic figure. You know, he was brave, he stood up, you know, spoke his mind, he was a man. I know that they rebroadcast some of our Radio Free Dixie on Radio Hanoi. It is a crying shame that hypocritical and double-dealing Mr. Charlie has the audacity to rabble-rouse racist America to the point of accepting massive violence against the innocent people of Vietnam while brainwashing the oppressed Negro to adhere to the masochistic philosophy of nonviolence. Yes, Big Daddy orders a semi-state of war footing and dispatches elite troops to defend Mr. Charlie's version of democracy in Vietnam, while Afro-Americans bleed and die from the lack of police protection in the black ghettos of racist America. What a sham. What blatant hypocrisy. I was concerned about what the government was going to say about all of our speeches and I knew that we had to continue doing something and that was our way of fighting the injustices that were going on against our people in the United States. And so I was not so concerned that I was willing to stop doing what we had to do. Well, he was more of a pawn than a player in the Cold War. He's, you know, the, the Cuban revolution uh, prided itself on its racial egalitarianism. So to shelter the fleeing black uh, <laughs> activist uh, from the South was help them politically. But that was not a perfect marriage because Robert wasn't a communist and he wasn't anybody's party line man in any sense. As an individual, they treated me quite well in Cuba. But with some of the party people, I had some problem. They took the position that uh, my position would uh, drive a wedge between the white working class and the black if blacks uh, used my method of self-defense. So as a result of this, there was this friction. So and then I had to leave Cuba. I want to go home. warmly welcome Mr. Robert Williams, noted Afro-American leader, and Mrs. Williams. Wherever they go, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Williams are cordially welcomed by the Chinese people, who deeply admire the just struggle of the black people in the United States. He kept trying to return to the United States, but he kept being turned down. 
He uh, approached the Swiss to intercede for him, and uh, because the United States did not want him back in the United States, the whole idea was to get rid of him as a uh, part leader of a movement. And I missed our people because I was thrown into an environment of total strangers. I made friends wherever I went, but I missed mostly just the comradeship of my friends and family. What you have to understand about the decision of the United States government to let Robert Williams come home in 1969 is that the Nixon administration was moving towards opening diplomatic relations with China. Our most beloved and respected leader comes to the rostrum on top of Tiananmen Gate Tower. Mr. and Mrs. Robert Williams are among the distinguished guests on the rostrum. This was in the period of the Cultural Revolution. It was a very, China was closed off and chaotic. And the, the uh, State Department very much wanted to know what Robert Williams knew. Robert Williams, a fugitive and one of the first of the black militants, is being supplied with an entire jetliner for his return tomorrow from a self-exile in communist and African lands. He's wanted on eight-year-old kidnapping charges in North Carolina involving a white couple allegedly taken hostage during racial disorders. Williams has been held in Great Britain for the last week since airlines refused to honor his ticket to Detroit, the base of a black separatist movement which made him its president. The airlines feared a possible hijacking or civil demonstrations. At the request of the U.S. government, Transworld Airlines changed its position but said a special flight would be arranged to carry only Williams and his lawyer. Their tickets cost $282 each. The flight will cost TWA about $20,000. Last night, I went to sleep in Detroit City. And I dreamed about the cotton fields and home. I dreamed about my mother, dear old Pappy, sister and brother. In some ways, uh, the CIA really expects Robert to step to the fore and become the central figure in the black power movement. They essentially say, you know, Malcolm X is dead, Stokely Carmichael, Eldridge Cleaver, they're out of the country. You know, there's, there's this vacuum of leadership, and they fully expect Robert Williams to step into it. He never wanted to be a leader. He never really wanted to be in that lead role. He was following what he felt he needed to follow and had to follow to try to get change, but he didn't want to be the one to be out front all the time. I want to go home. He's been abroad at that point for eight years, and he's dragged his wife and family halfway around the world, and he's tired. He was famous. He was a poster. He was the icon of black power. But he went, you know, they moved out to Western Mission and went to Baldwin, and he joined the local NAACP, and he spoke at colleges and at prisons. He tried to, to, uh, to be a sort of a local community person. He likes to say that, huh? Yeah. Or Mabel. Huh? One more shot in here. I hope when I get... You, get what? <laughs> you hope you get there, that's all. <laughs> that's what he hoped. <laughs> oh, man. Seeing him as a figure who managed to stay active, stay vocal, stay militant uh, during a long period of time when the cost of doing that was tremendous makes him to me a heroic figure. He used to tell a story about George Washington going out and fighting and then returning to Mount Vernon and live out uh, his, his days as a gentleman farmer or whatever. And he said, 
I want I would like to have in our race somebody who struggled against the system and went home to Mount Vernon. And so Monroe was kind of like his Mount Vernon. 1994, Rob began to uh, have some medical problems. And when we went to uh, have a physical exam, we found out that uh, he had prostate cancer. He got over that, and we were talking about my retirement and returning to Monroe. But he started slowing down a little after then, and uh, suddenly he had started having night sweats. And uh, the, the uh, Hodgkin's disease came on very quickly. Oh, he made me promise that should he die first, I should take him back to Monroe. I'm called a criminal for advocating that people have the right to defend themselves, for telling them to get off their asses and fight for what they deserve. If that's criminal, then I hope, I hope that I will always be a criminal. 